ale nie chcemy, bo Łukasz nie zdecyduje. Także o ten... W ogóle sobie nic nie będę robił. Cały czas mój w górze. Mam okay do kamery, to Łukasz będzie wiedział, że jest ok, i on wtedy po spaniu będzie wszystko. Dobra. A, tak, żeby było mnie widać. No, jest to, słuchajcie, bardzo surrealna jakaś sytuacja. No. Halo, bo to jest też mikrofon, którego wy nie słyszycie, ale jest słyszalny w Stanach Zjednoczonych. Znaczy, kompletnie nie wiem, jak się zachować w tej sytuacji. No dobrze, słuchajcie, to może ja zrobię szybkie przedstawienie. Zaraz się będziemy łączyć z ze znakomitą badaczką akademiczką Mimi Scheller, która jest afiliowana przy Uniwersytecie Worcester, tam jest dziekanką i jest specjalistką od studiów, znaczy zajmuje się studiami nad mobilnością, nad migracjami, ruchem. No i chyba jest jedną w ogóle z czołowych przedstawicielek tej dziedziny, jest współzałożycielką takiej takiego pisma Mobilities, jest autorką wspaniałej antologii wydanej dwa lata temu przez Versobooks Mobility Justice, więc wszystko co związane z ruchem i też wszystkimi czynnikami, które ten wprawiają ludzi w ruch, bo ona się głównie zajmuje jednak homo sapiens po tych różnych naszych dzisiejszych opowieściach o innych organizmach, o roślinach, które podróżują z ludźmi, za ludźmi, w są inwazyjne, bądź też nie są inwazyjne, no teraz skoncentrujemy się na tym, co chyba najbardziej nam leży na sercu, będąc dokładnie w tym miejscu, malowniczym, ale niech to nie zasłania nam widoku na las i to, co się kryje w, tym ciemnych, w ciemnej puszczy. Więc no tak, więc, więc po, jeszcze ch chciałbym podziękować Agacie za to, że nas karmi. Nie wiem, gdzie jest Agata. Agata pali. Agato, bardzo dziękujemy. Dziękujemy, że nie zostawiasz nas głodnymi. No dobrze, to co, czyli czy możemy się jakoś połączyć już? Czy tak? To jest możliwe? Hello, Mimi, can you hear me? Yes, hello, hello. Oh, fantastic. Hello. Uh, we've had like a very intense day, so this is like a kind of, uh, I don't know, like the farewell kind of speech, talk, lecture. Uh, so we are very much excited. We are in a very beautiful place. You know, it's hard to believe in this kind of wooden house in the middle of the forest with this uh, bunch of uh, like amazing activists, artists, uh, comrades. So yeah, so the floor is yours. It's like, it's our like a uh, final thing. Then we'll watch a film by Anna Rejkowska and that's it. I guess we can party. We can really like conclude this, uh, this, this seminar today. So Mimi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for like accepting our invitation. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to join you. Here we suddenly have uh, it's almost like summertime and it was a commencement ceremony today at my university. So it's uh, quite a change to be with you there. But that's, of course, one of the things I want us to think about is how we can remember our connections across distances, across places, across borders, that we are all connected. Um, and let me begin, I'll talk a little bit first about some of the concepts that I use in my work. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to say something about mobility justice to begin with. And this theory of mobility justice is meant to help us address the combined crises around climate change and the kinds of displacements that that is causing, unsustainable urban mobilities. So thinking about our sort of transportation systems and what, uh, how can we reduce fossil fuel use? And then also the crisis of our borders. And in particular, the current kind of crackdown that's happening around the world on transnational migrations of different kinds in different places. And what I'm trying to do in the book is partly to think about how these are connected. That is how we connect mobilities across different mobility regimes, across different scales uh, from our, bodily experience um, of just being able to move freely within our own 
home, within buildings, within streets, through uh, the kinds of circulations that happen across cities and then across nations and borders, but also thinking about the planetary mobilities that lie behind that, that is the mobilities of energy, of resources, of infrastructure. So all of these mobilities are politically governed by mobility regimes. That includes laws and regulations and practices uh, governing who and what can move, but also who can stay put, who can reside, who can dwell, when, where, how, and under what conditions. So the purpose of the book is very much to look at these inequities and power differences in who can move, who cannot move, who can dwell, and who cannot. So I ask questions, can we create more equitable forms of dwelling and moving amidst the current legacies of racial injustice, climate injustice, mobility injustice of various kinds? And also, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic, I want to ask how post-pandemic policy and planning around decarbonization could instigate more just, equitable, and sustainable mobilities as we face not just the change in climate, but also the attendant disruptions that will come with that and the wars like those that we are seeing today. So uh, let's go to the next slide. And just to give a little bit more of the, the sort of theoretical context behind this, I draw on the work of um, Saskia Sassen and of Popescu, who have talked about how borders are not simply edges or limits or barriers that control mobility um, in and out of a territory. And nor does the territory pre-exist the border, but instead they talk about the relation between these two terms as understood through bordering practices. And to give an example of bordering practices, um, I mean, I think about how my own family, the, the story that's been passed down to me is that my family left various parts of Eastern Europe between about 1890 and 1905, right? And so they'll refer to towns and, and villages that they came from that were outside of Kiev, outside of Odessa, outside of Lviv, outside of Minsk. They came, my great grandparents came from these different villages and towns in that part of the world and they came to America and that migration made possible my whole life here, right? A couple generations later, but the places they came from are no longer bordered in the same way. They might say they came from uh, the Russian empire, right? They came from Russia, but those places are not Russia now. So, and we see the conflicts, the ongoing conflicts around those particular borders, those nationalities, those questions of who controls which territory. So that's this idea of bordering practices and the different kinds of territoriality that are enforced through those bordering practices. And I also refer to Thomas Nail's work, Theory of the Border, which also conceptualizes borders, not as fixed dividers or walls that prevent movement, but rather as technologies that control and process movement in a kind of fluid dynamics. So borders work to allow some things and some people through and to keep others out. And also he talks, uh, drawing on Sasson's work on the idea of expansion by expulsion and the way in which territory itself moves. That is, there are ongoing land grabs, right? Whether it's for agriculture or mining or claiming water and energy resources. We see that the most powerful corporations and the most powerful countries can seize these things from other places. And that is related to outbreaks of war and social violence that in turn drive migration flows and complex circulations in what he refers to as a kinopolitics. And in my own work on mobilities um, studies, uh, several of us use the term kinopolitics to refer to the politics of movement 
but also to think about po how politics itself, the political realm, depends on freedom of movement and freedom of assembly, which are the basis of a free polity. So kinopolitics is meant to capture both ideas of that term. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So we're in a, a unique moment right now of the COVID-19 pandemic and its ongoing disruption of mobilities of different kinds. The mobilities of the virus itself have unleashed not only a disruption of everyday human movements and mobility, but also a vast intensification of already existing relations of uneven mobilities and immobilities. That is, the virus has kind of brought out the worst in our society in some ways by showing that the most powerful, the wealthiest people were able to determine how they would protect themselves, where they could move to be safe, how they could move around. And it was often the poorest people and the working people who were called the essential workers who had to expose themselves to mobility to keep things running, keep things working. They had to be exposed to potential infection with the virus. At the same time, in the first year of the pandemic, by April 2020, more than, uh, or in the first months of the pandemic, more than 130 countries had already introduced entry restrictions at their borders. The Migration Policy Institute had said at, at that time in uh, April um, that crossing an international border to a country of safety and filing an asylum claim is no longer possible in many places. And that kind of set off what they describe as a seismic shock to the foundations of a post-World War II international protection system that relies on the goodwill of national governments to grant access to their territory for those in need. And that's what we've been living through for the last two years is this shock to the system, this, this collapse of the understandings of the international protection system that had existed you know, since the agreements made after World War II for the protection of refugees in the aftermath of the Holocaust. So we see that happening. And yet we also know that before the pandemic, as part of the global immigration control regime, there was already a trend towards selective closure of national spaces to racialized bodies, that is to those who were defined as outsiders and to those who were impoverished or in need of international protection, those people were already being deprived of elementary rights to mobility. So the unequal mobility regime has been perpetuated through determining that some bodies can now move freely and others cannot, and by determining how and when they can move. And I'm, of course, less familiar with the precise situation that you are facing there on the Polish border. I'm sure you know more about it than I do. So I wanted to compare it a little bit to the experience that we are having here in the United States. And if we go to my next slide, um, I wanted to link this. I'm going to say a little bit about the U.S.-Mexico border, but I want to link this argument to questions of climate change because it's climate change that is very significant in driving some of the changing mobility regimes that we see here. So I draw on some work by colleagues around the idea of climate mobilities. So there had been discussions around climate migration and this idea that there was an emergency where we would be flooded by so-called climate migrants. The climate mobilities approach tries to highlight that there's actually not just a mass wave of migration that's coming induced by climate change, but that there are multiple mobilities in the context of a changing climate. And there are interrelations between mobilities and immobilities and other flows, not just of people, but of plants, of animals, of information, of climate risk. So the idea is to begin to look at the plurality and the politics of human and more than human movement in the context of climate change. 
And if we begin to pay attention to that multiplicity of climate change related moves, we see that they might involve some relocation, both internally within a country and externally, but also circular mobilities, return mobilities, or immobilities in some cases. And these are embedded in ongoing patterns and histories and material and political conditions, which shape how those movements take place. And all of those human mobilities and immobilities are of course entangled with the mobilities of plants, of crops, of animals, of insects, of weather, of energy and greenhouse gas production and waste and all of the infrastructures that make that happen. And what we see increasingly is these complex entanglements of those infrastructures, which have effects on each other. So we see that a war in one place affects the agricultural commodity system, or we see that the pandemic affected warehouses and in turn ports and shipping containers and so on. And we see that the as the climate changes, there might be insects, right? New insects coming that we haven't seen before and they're attacking our plants and crops. So all of these things are co-affecting each other. And human mobilities are part of that wider planetary mobility and that movement of different risks of different, um, uh, in, including vi the virus, COVID-19 virus itself, right? The movements of the virus uh, are mixed in with all of these other mobilities. So that brings me to the question of the US-Mexico border that I wanna say a little bit about in the next slide. And this is where I think there's a comparison that we can make between your situation and the situation here, which is that a border crisis was built through the production of crisis. And what I wanna emphasize is the way in which US border policies created a media spectacle of racialized exclusion. That is by stopping the flow of people across the border. In this instance, this was in September of 2021, 14,000 people, many with young children were stopped um, and they had been migrating originally from Haiti. They had left Haiti after the 2010 earthquake. They had gone to countries like Brazil and Chile. They had been working there. And then when the pandemic hit and there were the closures of business due to the pandemic, people were pushed, pushed out of those Latin American countries and they started heading north and they came across Central America, they came across Mexico and they got to the US border and they were stopped there. And there was this um, law, uh, well, a, a executive um, decision called Title 42. And Title 42 is the US policy that said, because of the risk of COVID-19 and the pandemic, we will unilaterally shut the border and not allow people to cross and make asylum claims. And so in this moment, 14,000 people in this particular month, in this instance, were stopped on the border. And then deportations began. And so it was, there was no asylum claim. There was no um, practice of protection under international asylum laws. And instead, a private contracting company was hired to just start flying people back to Haiti. And to this day, Title 42 remains in effect. And uh, since the Biden administration came into office, more than 20,000 Haitians have been deported without being able to make a claim at the US border. And I feel like that kind of media spectacle is one of these bordering practices where refugees, potential refugees are being used. They're being used politically. They're being used to make a point about borders, about immigration. And of course, I was thinking about all of this and writing about this before the context of the war in Ukraine. And of course, we've seen this incredible impact of the war, the millions of people displaced and, and crossing borders. And we've also seen the incredible willingness of people like in Poland to take in 
those displaced people, people displaced by war, people who they saw as similar to them, right, were welcomed and given uh, refuge in private homes, right, by by activists, by private people working, and and that I think is the the sort of driving ethic behind the kind of border practices that I want to talk about and that I think we need to defend, that we need to continue to press upon our governments to say that people are willing to take in refugees and that's what the international asylum system was built upon. And instead, this country, my country, has completely shut down the, the immigration system. It's, it's, it's at much lower levels than it ever was and it's violating many laws of, of protection. And so we need to take these spectacles of the border and not play into the descriptions of them as migrants flooding our borders and overwhelming us, but to try to change the framing of it to change how we think about it. Um, next slide. So in, in my book, Mobility Justice, which was published long before, and any of this happened right in 2018, before the pandemic, before the current wars, I wanted to sort of bring back to our attention some of the basic principles of cross-border mobility justice. Some of these are the ones we already know are protected um, by the UN Charter. All people shall enjoy a right to exit and re-enter the territory from which they originate. There is a right to refuge for those fleeing violence, persecution, and loss of domicile by war. But can we add to this that people displaced by climate change shall have a right to resettlement in other countries, especially those countries that contributed the most to climate change? And here I see a responsibility on countries like the United States, but also like the European Union, that were large contributors to the production of greenhouse gases and, and climate disruption to make reparations, that is climate reparations that could take the form of allowing people who are drastically affected by climate change to come into the country and certainly at least for temporary purposes, which um, should be allowed. And nobody should be de detained or deported without due process of the law, which is what we increasingly see happening. Immigration law in particular shall not be used to exclude entire categories of persons on the basis of race, religion, ethnicity, nationality, sexuality, or health status. And again, those are laws that we see many countries using to manipulate today who is allowed in and who is not allowed in. So when we saw President Trump here in the United States do what was called the Muslim ban, it was um, a violation of this principle. And I think it's important that we reaffirm these principles, but also that we take them further. And if we go to the next slide, in my own work, I've begun to talk about the idea of commoning um, mobilities and mobile commoning. So the idea of commoning is that there are, are socially produced rules for sharing and moving together with others. Uh, just as we say that a commons, a common, uh, when we talk about the commons, we're saying that it is neither private nor public. Mobile commoning suggests something that is a temporary dwelling and moving together. That is, the commons are not just a shared territory or a natural resource or a common open product, but it's a radical way of moving together in the world sharing spaces that include human and more than human needs, refusing violent enclosures of private property and state territoriality that imposes practices that uh, lead to the death of others. How can such practices of overlapping access to mobile commons and assertions of mobile commoning help us envision transitions toward greater mobility justice? in the face of the pandemic, in the face of climate change, in the face of racialized borders and exclusions, can we think even beyond the kind of principles of the liberal order of international law and begin to think about other ways of recognizing commoning? And so that it's not just, it's a human rights question, but it's beyond a human rights question. It's a question of also the rights of nature. 
And right now the walls being built around the wor world, for example, the border wall being built on the US-Mexico border is also destroying natural habitats. It's stopping the movements of animals and uh, that, that have migrated there, right, for millions of years. And those rights also need to pre be protected. And so I think, um, I know I've, I've put a lot of ideas out there and you're probably, I know you're at the end of a long day. So maybe I should stop there and try to get a conversation going and hear um, any responses about this or questions. Um, I would love to have a dialogue with you. Thank you so much. I'm looking for some like volunteers. No, it's not. <laughs> it's upside down. <laughs> Koba. Yeah, I can ask you. Um, thank you so much for the uh, wonderful lecture. I wanted to ask you as an expert, because I have you know, no knowledge of this. Uh, you mentioned the international asylum system that was implemented after the Second World War and that it was an effective tool for international mobility, refugee and migration policies for some time. So I was wondering historically, when the dismantlement of it started, when it stopped really working and maybe why? What, what were the social, political, cultural, you know, economic conditions that affected you know, the dismantling uh, of this system? Because in Poland, at the same time, we are, you know, accepting two and a half million refugees uh, from Ukraine. At the same time, we are building a border wall on the Polish-Belarusian border, not allowing thousands of people from countries like Afghanistan and Syria uh, to Poland. And, you know, our government can claim that this type of uh, building border walls on the borders of the European Union and pushing back refugees is just a European Union policy because it's been going on for years with the Schengen zone in Europe. So I'm wondering, you know, globally, when did it start and why? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I should say I'm, I'm not the um, total expert on all of those changes in the law, but I do know that as early as 2001, uh, there, there was this discussion of the idea of fortress Europe. So, you know, with the creation of Schengen space, which was for the open movement within Europe, there was a move towards protecting the external borders of Europe. So that move and that idea of fortress Europe um, probably relates to what's happening at your borders. But of course, there were other parts of the world where border walls were starting to be built. And, you know, so it, it's at least since the early 2000s. And in the United States, it was also under the, um, the first Bush administration, and then even more so under the second Bush administration, that the United States policy, when Congress was controlled, whether by Republicans or Democrats, I have to say, the policy was to build what began to be described as smart borders. And so both within Europe and in the United States, the development of smart border technologies involved building um, databases, connecting those databases internally, and then also building systems of detection where, so the idea was you could build walls, but walls might be less effective than having motion detectors and infrared detectors and, you know, and these days drones and all the new technologies. So that has been a long process that's been going on for, you know, tw 20 years at least. Um, I would just say that. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Gabor? I think you are thinking about the question. <laughs> they are still like processing now, you know, like it was and, like a very and dense, I can, while you're uh, you know. I can, while you're uh, sorry, are you still waiting for someone to ask? Because I was, I forgot to add to the other part of that answer was that, of course, what the why? Why did that happen? Um, and certainly there, 
it fed into the rise of a more nationalist politics, right? And nationalist politics, ethno-nationalism have been on, on the rise over that entire period. And that has empowered certain political parties and certain political agendas. And so it's been politically useful um, to, to reinforce borders. Okay, I guess, um, I don't know if you can see me, I'm somewhere at the top here. Um, I have a question about the commoning of um, mobility justice and how, are there any strategies of spreading that message? Are there any ways that you've seen to be effective to spread this message? Um, I very much agree with this, <laughs> but I'm just thinking of, um, as as we see the rise of all the walls, as we see the rise of Fortress Europe, as we see the rise of, uh, of um, right-wing nationalist parties, is there a way of, um, is there some, I don't know, effective, good ideas of how to spread this message, not even to, politi to politicians, but more so um, to people and how to spread the idea of sharing the non-human human space uh, to be an open space, um, yeah, and how to sort of mobilize that in people. Yeah, that's um, such a great question. And I'm sure those of you who are political activists who are working on this might even have more ideas about it. It's it's interesting to me that the the debate in the Americas broadly is a bit different because of the rise of indigenous people's movements. And indigenous people's movements can, can sort of claim um, a precedent of relation to the land that was not based on property ownership and fencing off and walling off property in the, and that it was settler colonialism that brought that form of private property and uh, the violence um, of expulsion and genocide that went along with that. So here that, you know, there's been really interesting debates about settler colonialism, um, decolonizing, and what's also the relationship between uh, African American and Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latin American peoples and indigenous peoples. And so they, they've also used ideas around kind of recovering uh, a decolonial relation to land, that it would be involve a kind of commoning and that their relation to the land in the past was one of moving, right? Moving seasonally, moving say to the, to the shorelines, to fish and to the forests, to hunt and, um, and kind of having a, a, a relation with uh, animals and, and plants as part of that. So that creates a different basis for that kind of political agenda. What I'm uncertain of is in your situation, right? In Europe, where there are claims to a certain kind of settled people being there um, and having a right to a certain space as theirs. That's an interesting um, kind of difference in the, the political situation. Of course, when I look at it from, um, I mean, to be frank, from the personal history I told you of the sort of Jewish European experience, of course, the Jewish people of Eastern Europe were expelled in a way from that space over those, gener those several generations ago. Uh, and so the current claims to sort of territorial claim making and ethno-nationalism rest upon a, an already pre-existing um, genocide or expulsion of people, just as in the US it rests upon and in the settler colonial states, Canada and, and Latin America, it rests on an attempted genocide and expulsion of indigenous people. So it could be interesting to think about that and how do we go to roots that don't take us towards a kind of ethno-national claim to place, 
but instead open us to the sort of hist histories of mobilities and of people having gone through those places. And when you look at the history of commoning, it often looks at um, patterns of, of um, seafaring and port cities. Again, so it's um, that there's work by um, Marcus Redeker and Peter Leinbau on the Atlantic world and, and all the sort of mixing of people that happened, sailors and um, slaves and maroons and musicians and soldiers and all of these people. So it's a way of sort of retelling our histories that are not about being rooted and grounded in a place and that recognize that we've always been mobile and that that would maybe create a basis for having, it would have to be particular conversations in particular places about the different kinds of mobilities that have long permeated those places. And can we think about that differently? And then can that also be tied into thinking about our relation to the natural world and, and the non-human world uh, in ways that are also more, um, more ecologically uh, friendly and, and more um, recognize a kind of almost like the, poly, the rights of nature would be the other side of looking at that. Thank you so much. Uh, and a final question to Mimi. I guess the group of like eight hours of our session and like everybody feels kind of uh, exhausted probably. So thank you so much. It was like a really wonderful closing uh, statement. Uh, so which we understand in a completely different way sitting here like in the forest you know like thinking about all those you know people who are displaced dispossessed and uh, stuck you know like between uh the the belarusian and the, the 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 polish territories you know like in this kind of uh in this actually in the swampland you know so uh yeah so thank you so much and thank you for uh being our ghost like uh, i guess like a ghost you know like hunting <laughs> hunting this house uh yeah, which is like hunting. a really so real experience i have to say uh but it was really wonderful so thank you so much and uh have a great day you know you're like starting your day we are like kind of finishing up you know like so yeah. uh thank yeah. you and Once more. thank you thank you for the invitation to join you and thank you all for the work you're doing the concern the interest um and just as one final word, I'll say that it's in these spaces that are swamps and forests and, and the edges that um, that new relations are often built, right? That, that people can come together in unexpected ways. And I hope um, and think that that's what you're doing and the world appreciates it. So thank you. Thank you. Bye.